So here we are, once again. We are welcoming in the new year, again, impacted by this pandemic, the COVID pandemic. I'm here in this empty sanctuary, not completely empty. As you saw, we have our wonderful Cantor Corps and tech crew here. But you, but pretty much close to empty, missing all of you. And you there at home in front of your screens. And while we know this is the right thing to do in order to safeguard the health of our community, once again, we are forced to figure out new ways of connecting, of maintaining community, even though we are physically apart. So first, I just need to say thank you. Thank you for all that you have done to maintain our communal ties as one community of transcending these virtual spaces to, to continue to connect with one another. Thank you for your patience and your strength as we've been able to navigate this pandemic together. We've done it already for a year and a half and we can, we will continue to do it and deepen and grow our connections. And while last year, as we gathered for the high holidays, it was perhaps a bit of a novelty in approaching the high holidays in this way, this, this second time this year gives us this somber opportunity to deeply reflect on what this time means and what it reveals to us. We have learned so much. This pandemic and the changes that it has forced upon us were not only inconveniences, but they revealed important truths about ourselves and our communities. And there is another aspect to the uniqueness of this new year, which would have occurred this year regardless of how we gathered. And that is this year on the Jewish calendar, Rosh Hashanah, as we celebrate a new year, ushers also a special year, what's called the Shemitah year. The Torah teaches that just as we take every seventh day, Shabbat, as a day of rest, so too we should take every seventh year as a year of rest. It is a year of pausing, a year of reset that in its ideal form impacts all levels of our society. In reality, unlike Shabbat, the Shemitah is not observed in contemporary practice as it is envisioned in the Torah. Aspects of Shemitah are time and place specific to biblical times based on an agrarian society, community, rooted around a centralized religious system located in the ancient temple in Jerusalem. However, like many aspects of biblical practice, of Torah practice, they can be observed in their spirit, if not the letter. And the Shemitah year deserves our attention, especially at a time such as this. So while I generally come to you on Erev Rosh Hashanah with a list, a list of things that I have learned over the past year based on something that has been going on in my life, this year will be slightly different. I'm still bringing you a list of seven things, but this year we are looking forward and not back. This year we take this unique opportunity to look at our calendar and think about how this moment in time is proving so crucial. So tonight, I invite you to join me in thinking about the seven practices of the Shemitah year and why they are so desperately needed today. Number one, and we turn to Exodus in the Torah, the first mention of Shemitah. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield, but in the seventh you shall let it rest and lie fallow. Let the needy among your people eat of it, and what they leave let the wild beasts eat. You shall do the same with your vineyards and your olive groves. Exodus 23. There are actually three practices of Shemitah embedded in these two verses, and we'll take them in turn. The first is letting the fields lie fallow. Just as we are meant to take a rest from our labor every seven days, the earth is meant to rest from labor every seven years. Now, I know that this might raise up questions about how 
an agrarian society that does not grow crops for a year survive? Trust me, the Torah has an answer for that. But that should not distract us from the idea in this verse that the earth needs to rest. And part of our stewardship of the earth is not to overwork it. This summer, particularly, it has become abundantly clear the realities of climate change and what our human impact has wrought. We prepare not just for the summer, but for smoke season. We experience extreme heat like we had not before, resulting in the loss of crops, of animal life, and human life. The hurricanes that affected the South and the East were stronger than ever, bringing in flooding that killed people who were trapped in their cars and in their basement apartments. We are in a climate crisis. I like to think at times with humility that this extreme weather is extreme only to us and our ability to live with it and through it. The earth will adapt and survive. It is we as humans that might not, that we don't need to save the earth, we need to save ourselves. But what that requires is a shift in attitude an approach in how we are in this world. For so much of human history, we have seen an exploitation of the earth for human gain. And the impact we have made in our relatively short time on this planet has been disproportional. Genesis 2.15 teaches that we are here to till and to tend the earth, but we seem to have neglected that second part. By centering the earth during the Shemitah year, by declaring it off limits to human consumption during this period, the Torah is guiding us to a new understanding of our relationship with the natural world. That we are not above the earth, but we are of it. The second teaching from this verse about Shemitah from Exodus is that during the year that the fields grow on their own, the resulting growth from those fields are for the poor. In other words, Shemitah teaches that we are to have responsibility for those in need in our midst. And it's not just about letting the earth rest from potential overconsumption, but a check on the inequality of wealth in our societies. The poor are given priority during Shemitah. One thing that the pandemic showed us is that we are lacking a true social safety net in our country. And yet through policies, albeit temporary, that provided direct payments to people, we have shown that it is possible to redistribute wealth. Can we continue to live into this when it is not a crisis? This is an issue writ large, and yet it is also one that we can look on here at our local level. Homelessness and housing are issues here in Olympia, ones that we have engaged with in the past, but not as much recently, and hopefully more so moving into the future. We made this tremendous step this incredible step, and I'm so proud of us as a community to more than double our footprint in downtown Olympia with the purchase of the adjacent lot. And so we could also examine or re-examine our role as downtown citizens and neighbors and recommit to the work with our partners at Interfaith Works to create and maintain space for all of Olympia's residents. This is not the only time in the Torah that we are told to protect the vulnerable. Providing for the poor is not something we are meant to do just every seven years, but by connecting providing for the poor with the idea of letting our fields lie fallow, Shemitah teaches that we must have in mind the fundamental equality among individuals, regardless of status. That property ownership and material goods are fleeting. That ultimately everything is ownerless. And therefore, we must pro provide for everyone's needs. The third teaching of Shemitah that also comes from this verse in Exodus, namely that as the fields are fallow and the poor get their fair share, then the wild beasts are able to benefit from the land. There is a consciousness that we have a responsibility, responsibility not only to the earth, but to all life that lives within it. Again, this is a problem of perspective, of seeing ourselves above the world and not of it. It's what Aldo Leopold called the land ethic when he writes, in short, the land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for their fellow members and also respect for the community as such. 
that we are one, not the one. Now, ever since moving to the Northwest, I've been so taken and moved with the salmon that every year around the high holiday season is marked by the return of the salmon who make their way from the oceans to the streams of their birth to create new life and then die. Their process of renewal and rebirth is timed to our process of renewal and rebirth and should serve as a reminder that our Jewish tradition is deeply connected to the earth and its cycles. The cycle of the salmon also feeds other animals, the waters in which they live and the forests that surround those waters, and they feed us. And yet it is human activity which threatens them and their existence. Since living here, I've been humbled to learn about the deep spiritual, cultural, and economic significance of salmon to Northwest Native tribes on whose land we gather. It is a reminder of a proper and holistic relationship with the world in which we live. The Shemitah teaches that, rec that recognizes, the Shemitah teaching that recognizes that wild beasts are a part of the system reminds us that we need to not only work to make the earth habitable for us, but for other species as well. Salmon are but one of the wild beasts that we need to be mindful of and care for. It's perhaps one we as a Northwest Jewish congregation can take particular interest in. For the fourth teaching of Shemitah, we turn back to the Torah, to a different section, to the book of Deuteronomy, where we read in chapter 15, every seventh year you shall practice remission of debts. This shall be the nature of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the due that they claim from their fellow. They shall not dun their fellow or kin, for the remission proclaimed is of God. What a radical notion this brings. The idea that every seven years, debts are to be forgiven. And we know that we are a society built on debt. The loads of student debt carried by many in this country, including rabbis. The threat and reality of medical debt as well, when even with insurance, an unfortunate illness or accident can spell financial disaster. But it is more than just debt itself. I had this Epiphany recently, reading about the Supreme Court decision to end President Biden's eviction moratorium. As the article described the decision, it noted how understandably tenants organizations were upset with the ruling while landlord organizations praised it. And I thought this is the society that we live in, that we pit people against each other. Whether it's landlord tenant or have and have not or lender and debtor, we favor this transactional relationship, and when we do so, usually one person benefits at the expense of another. This is not a cooperative society. We know that unchecked capitalism can leave people behind. It is not interested in making sure everyone has their needs met. But what would it mean, then, to forgive debts in our society? But more so, what does it mean to create an economy that does not require debt to access basic things like education or healthcare that sets up cooperation and not competition. This from the fourth teaching of Shemitah. Numbers five and six are also contained within a single verse. If a fellow Hebrew, man or woman is sold to you, they shall serve you six years. And then the seventh year you shall set them free. When you set them free, do not let them go empty handed, Furnish them out of the flock, the threshing floor, and the vat with which God has blessed you. Bear in mind that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and God redeemed you. Therefore, I enjoin this commandment upon you today. Every seventh year, we are meant to free the slaves. Without getting into what the Torah means when it is permitting slavery, we can, that's another topic for a different time, but we can safely say that there is currently slavery today. And I don't just mean the fact that slavery is still enshrined in the constitution as a legal punishment for crime or the persistence of human trafficking worldwide and in our local community, or even how mass incarceration is an extension of slavery in the United States, curtailing the rights and privileges of those who have been in prison, which is disproportionately people of color. That is all there and that needs to be examined. 
But the pandemic revealed too how our society is dependent on a class of essential workers who do not have access to certain privileges and are in a sense, slaves to their jobs. Ones who cannot take off work to get the vaccine or are scared of losing work to potential side effects, who don't have access to childcare or parental leave, or those who work in adverse working conditions who are prevented from unionizing. And in the cruel irony of the pandemic whose health insurance, even if they have it, is tied to their employment. So if they lose work, they lose access to affordable health care during a time when it is most necessary. Modern day slavery is also in the form of the recent law in Texas that controls the reproductive choices and health of those who are or may become pregnant. And modern day slavery is draconian voting laws that seek to prevent classes of people in having a voice in creating the laws by which they will in turn be governed. As Martin Luther King said, it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. By including the freeing of slaves as part of this seven year cycle, the Shemitah year challenges us to examine who is it in our society that either explicitly or implicitly is kept down, whose choices are limited, who cannot by design live up to their full potential, and then to go and address and repair those inequalities in our system. And when we free the slaves, according to the Torah, you do not just let them go, but you provide them with a form of restitution or compensation for the time that they worked in order to set them on an even playing field as a free person, this practice of Shemitah. And what this raises for us, that as we look back at the history of our country and the institution of slavery that persisted for centuries, that it is time that we deeply engage with the idea of reparations. Jewish communities are beginning to talk more and more about our responsibilities to engage with the, the idea of reparations. Our Reconstructionist movement has taken it on. My rabbinic association has passed a resolution supporting it. And we've begun even to talk and read about it here at TBH. And all this is done with the understanding that as Rabbi Sharon Brous writes, that we did not create this problem, but that does not free us from being part of the solution. We are beneficiaries of a national, we as Jews are beneficiaries of a national economic system that was built on stolen land and stolen labor, a foundational wrong that has never been rectified. In our own story of slavery in the Torah, we read how the Israelites took the gold and silver from the Egyptians on their way to freedom, a form of reparations, payment for the 400 years of servitude. In contemporary history, we have the model of reparations after the Holocaust, which would not undo the tragic and horrific past, but allow for a better and hopeful future. And more broadly, we have simply the idea of teshuva, which we are focused on during these days of awe, which requires us not just to atone or apologize for our past wrongs, but to actively try to find a way to repair, to rectify, to make right. And again, even if it cannot undo the past, it can remake the future. As Rabbi Brous writes, reparations would not suddenly ensure economic equality, nor would they erase generations of trauma, but they would offer some financial redress. And most significantly, they would signal a reckoning that our nation desperately needs. Shemitah this year reminds us of that need for reckoning. Taken all together, the fundamental lesson of these first six ideas of Shemitah is that there is a connection among environmental justice, racial justice, and economic justice. And it is our responsibility to recognize this intersectionality and act on it. When I think about why was Shemitah necessary, why is it in our most sacred text. I come to think that it is meant as a check on human nature. Because without it, without a limit to our actions, human nature is one of continual exploitation of land, of animal, of fellow human being. We have seen it throughout the entire course of human history. The pandemic made it that much more immediate and visible in our time. And in that way, Shemitah comes just when it is most needed. 
by suspending the notion of private ownership and letting the land do its own thing without human intervention, by favoring the needy and the animals, by forgiving debts, by freeing slaves and paying them reparations, Shemitah is there to lead us away from our worst impulses toward a new idea of human behavior. And these six practices are all connected in the seventh. And Moses instructed them as follows. Every seventh year, the year set for remission at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before God in the chosen place, you shall read this Torah aloud in the presence of all Israel. Gather the people, men, women, children, and strangers in your communities, that they may hear and so learn to revere God and to observe faithfully every word of this teaching. The seventh practice of Shemitah is an affirmative ritual component that is envisioned that the entire community come together every seven years on the holiday of Sukkot to hear the Torah. One could imagine what this must have been like in ancient times, the grandeur and pageantry and celebration of the entire community coming together, making that pilgrimage, hearing the words of our sacred text. And while we do enact elements of this ritual in our contemporary practice, we read the entirety of the Torah over the course of a whole year while we're gathered together in community. The vision of this ritual has yet to be fully achieved. For what is described here is the creation and coalescing of radically inclusive community a covenantal community of all ages, classes, genders, backgrounds, abilities that is joined together by sacred text, tradition, and practice. A covenantal community that honors its ancestors and teaches its children, that protects the vulnerable and takes care of each other's needs, that finds opportunities to join together in fun and celebration and support during the difficulties a covenantal community that prizes equality, justice, and peace. We are being tested in a way now that we have not been in recent history. Fissures are deepening, the foundations are crumbling, internal and external threats challenge us. And tonight, we turn the page to a new year and a new hope for what is possible. Because tonight we also enter into the sacred time of Shemitah, arriving on our calendar to remind us, to command us, to live into and fulfill the essence of what it and its seven constituent parts require to build a society that works for everyone. <laughs>